Okay, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate that very much. Uh, this is really special for, for us at Drexel, for me personally. Uh, this is the first in what I hope will be a long series of distinguished lectures. And we have this named in honor of the program's founder, uh, Mr. Joe Lambert, uh, Joe Lambert Sr. And Joe, uh, over some 40 years ago, uh, created this program really out of nothing. It was a program that he really envisioned and he kind of did it in a vacuum. Today, there's, there's hundreds of construction management programs across the country and the world, but when he started this, there was only a handful, and I don't think he really knew that much about what was going on in the rest of the world, but he saw a need. He saw a niche, uh, a, a, a place for people that were technically oriented, but wanted to be the conductors of the opera, so to speak. And so he, he d developed this program, and uh, you know, we were just ever so grateful for that because, you know, where we're at today and where we're going is just tremendous, it's just tremendous. We're on a tremendous upward trajectory, but we would have never been there if he didn't initially get us started. So we want to honor Joe's uh, memory with this series. Uh, we will also be launching a, uh, a memorial fund in Joe Lambert's name. So um, you'll certainly be hearing more about that. But we hope that this is going to be an annual event. And I couldn't think of a better guest speaker to have for this, a more appropriate guest speaker than Dr. Chris Fiore. Uh, Chris is a, 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 a friend and colleague, uh, but she's also, we're also kind of related. She's got all four of her degrees from Drexel, and her PhD advisor is our good friend, Dr. Joe Martin. My PhD advisor was Dr. Joe Martin, and all of us folks that do your PhDs under, under Joe, we're referred to as Joe's guys, Joe's boys. Well, this is one of Joe's girls. So we're kind of related, Chris. We're kind of <laughs> almost brother and sister, almost. But, uh, you know, Chris has really, really made a name for herself since uh, graduating from Drexel. She spent some time in the Air Force, had time teaching in the Air Force Academy, uh, time teaching in the Del Webb School uh, of Construction at Arizona State. Uh, and now she is the Associate Director of the Myers Lawson School of Construction at Virginia Tech. And uh, Chris has a number of accomplishments uh, in 2010, I believe. She was uh, one of the top 25 newsmakers in ENR, quite a, a significant recognition. And, uh, you know, she, she's, she's got a lot, of, a, a lot of accomplishments to her name, but she remains a very grounded, practical person one that is really, really student focused. She coaches the ASC teams, not team, teams at Virginia Tech and the Myers Lawson School of Construction. And uh, judging by the fact that some of her former students are here, uh, she's made quite an impression on them and, and uh, uh, we're very uh, glad to have her here. So uh, Chris's bio is that uh, she is the Preston and Catherine White Fellow and Associate Director of the Myers Lawson School of Construction at Virginia Tech. She received her BS, MS, and PhD in civil engineering with a concentration in geotechnical engineering from Drexel in 1992, 94, and 97, respectively. She served as a civil engineering officer in the United States Air Force and taught at both the United States Air Force Academy and Arizona State University before joining the faculty of Virginia Tech in 2007. Her interest in ancient construction led to the National Science Foundation grant to explore the construction techniques of the Inca, specifically the Inca Road throughout Peru. This research work led in part to the uh, Smithsonian exhibit at the Museum of Native American Indian uh, opening in 2000, June 2015. She was recognized as the engineering news record top 25 newsmakers for uh, 2010 for her research on the Inca Road. Additionally, Dr. Fiore was featured on the Science Channel in an episode of Strip the City pertaining to Machu Picchu. Dr. Fiore leads the construction engineering and management program, also facilitates the service learning programs for the Myers Lawson School of Construction. She has led uh, diverse groups of student teams to Vietnam, Kenya, Belize, Guatemala, and Haiti to complete construction projects and community engagement programs. Currently, her work focuses in, uh, in Guatemala and Belize. She also serves as a faculty fellow for the uh, Sigma Phi Epsilon fraternity and is co-advisor of the Bridges to Prosperity student chapter. In her spare time, Chris enjoys working with local nonprofits such as Peacework and Habitat for Humanity, traveling, beekeeping, and scuba diving. So please uh, welcome Dr. Chris Fiore.
Thanks, Bob. Well, thank you very much for having me here. It's, uh, it's fantastic to come back to campus and see all the changes. Um, and it, there have been phenomenal changes that have gone on on campus since I, since I left. I did spend 10 years here, almost, almost 10 years. And so to see the transformation, every time I come back, something's different. So it's fantastic. Um, well, when Bob asked me to do this, he wanted me to focus on the international service learning programs that, um, that we have at the Myers Lawson School of Construction. And so I'm going to show you today through a series of pictures, because okay, I, I firmly believe that the only way you can really experience some of the things that we have accomplished in some of these developing countries is, is through the pictures, and the pictures tell the story. Um, but as Bob said, I am the Associate Director of the Myers Lawson School of Construction, and our construction program, and I chair the Construction Engineering and Management Program, but our program is kind of unique because we're, we're I don't want to say we're not, we're not an experiment, we're, we're, we're functioning, so we're no longer an experiment, but we are a, a joint venture, put it that way, between engineering and architecture. And we have our curriculum is comprised of both engineering courses and building construction courses. And Sheila in the audience is a graduate of our building construction program. Um, and because we are meant to be an umbrella organization um, that brings construction to many, or represents construction on campus in many different ways, um, we have lots of different students that are involved with the work that we do. Um, and we involve as many different students across many different disciplines um, that are related to construction in our service learning projects. Um, I have to, to give a shout out to our director, Dr. Ryan Kleiner, because he is the, the crazy one that supports all of the travels and things that I want to do um, with the students. And he's trusted me to take his son to Haiti twice. So um, we have a, a, a really thriving service learning program now. But as you'll see, um, it kind of evolved over several years um, before we actually began to, to get to the point now where we're, we're really going to be thriving. So today, in each of these, I'm going to talk about critical components, the collaborators that we have on board, um, logistics, okay, because that's generally the major question I get every time I talk about taking students anywhere outside of the country where there's a State Department warning, okay, and that's typically where I take students. Um, and so there's a lot of logistics and things like that. And then the intangible benefits. It's very obvious to see the, the um, construction and the work that we do in these countries. However, there's many intangibles that I personally had never counted on um, actually coming out of the programs that we've, that we've run. Um, the big question that I get asked a lot is why. Generally, this is from my own family. Why do you need to go internationally and travel to do service work when you're, I'm at Virginia Tech, and there is you know, a, a very large population in Appalachia that doesn't have running water, doesn't have electricity, and all the things that we're kind of looking at in these developing countries. Um, and the bottom line is, the reason why we do this with students specifically is because it is, it's a, it's a real context for building. It's teaching students how to interact with another culture, Hey, it's also having them design and build in a resource constrained environment versus some of the environments that we typically are able to build in within the states. And it also pushes students out of their comfort zone. And you get to experience that in many different ways when you travel with students. Sometimes it's, you know, it's just a shock of where you're staying. Other times it's a complete mental breakdown because we haven't had access to the internet or electricity for you know, five days. Uh, so the idea of actually pushing people beyond their comfort zone is also something that I like to see in terms of our students that are participating because you can really pick your leaders. Okay? Also, um, one of my favorite authors, Mark Twain, said that travel is fatal to bigotry. Um, what's the other one? Bigotry, I wrote it down because I knew I was going to forget it. Bigotry, prejudice, and narrow-mindedness. And so I really do believe that by bringing students to a resource-constrained environment in a developing country, um, they can begin to see um, that no matter what situation you're in, that people are people no matter where they are. And we can, we can use our skill sets as engineers and constructors um, to actually make a difference um, and work with individuals. So now, I, service learning was never anything that I thought about in terms of actually something that I would engage in. It was just something that we did. You know, at the Air Force Academy, we would build houses every year, take them down to the Navajo Nation. 
we did service. I didn't think there was a whole lot of learning that went on. Okay, but then when I got into Virginia Tech, they were discussing this whole service learning process and this project and that the School of Construction really wanted to develop a service learning program. And being a skeptic at times, I thought, why do we need classes for this? People should just want to do this. Well, there's a limited amount of time, there's a limited amount of money, and so we began to look at ways to get involved. Um, and that was my, one, of my first ta one of my first taskings after getting the degree off the, the ground was to look at a way to develop more of a presence of our students internationally. And my first opportunity came very, very soon after I got to Virginia Tech, and that was to do a six-week trip to Vietnam. Um, and it was kind of one of those right place, right time sort of things. Um, it was right after our, um, our tragedy on campus, and the fact, one of the faculty members that was supposed to go to Vietnam just didn't want to leave his family. And so Dr. Tony Songer asked me, he said, hey, would you, would you want to go to Vietnam for six weeks? And I said, sure. We don't have any students yet. Our pro we just started to recruit. Our program wasn't off the ground. I talked to our director, and he said, sure, go. Um, and so off I went to uh, Canto, Vietnam. And now, the, the trip was for six weeks, and we traveled all over Vietnam, but we worked jointly. So when we look at collaborators, we worked with a local nonprofit that's based in Blacksburg, but they do work all over the world called PeaceWork. Um, and we also worked with um, other ACC schools. So Virginia Tech is in the ACC, the Atlantic Coast Conference. Um, and this group of students that we had with us um, were from all different ACC schools. And it was a real service learning study abroad um, program where there were, we taught three different courses, one in sociology, one in Vietnamese history, and then I got to do a construction project management course with a bunch of religion majors. It was interesting. Um, and I, I, I learned from that, that trip that you can get anybody excited about helping people. Um, and so I, we also had three faculty members from Wake Forest, and it was Tony Songer and myself from Virginia Tech. Uh, we only had two, two Virginia Tech engineers and one University of Maryland engineers, and the rest were sociologists, historians, archaeologists. So we had lots of different personalities and um, individuals on this trip. But our goal um, was to build two houses and to help build a bridge okay, while we were there, in addition to actually learning about Vietnamese culture. Again, this was my first immersion into any type of service learning environment, and what, what a great place to go, Vietnam, where you know I can't even fake the language, okay, in terms of what we're trying to get done. But this was my crew, and we built uh, one of one home. We split up into two different crew, crews, and uh, this was the man that we were building the home for. And he doesn't look excited in that picture, but I promise you, by the time we turn over the keys, he's very happy. Um, we had students build with local building materials, again, looking at, from a construction standpoint, looking at the actual different types of materials, how do you actually mix concrete and mortar and things like that when you don't have a concrete mixer. You have nothing really to measure things in, and your water source is a dirty river. Okay? So we realized that you can adapt and overcome and, and build things. And so um, we. We're utilizing the local brick, and I, I put this picture in here for, for two reasons. One is that um, Lamia was one of our civil engineering students from Virginia Tech, and she had said, she's like, I really should have majored in construction because, she said, it's great that I, I understand a little bit about masonry, but I've never done this work. She was very excited about it. that, and she also got married on Saturday, so I thought it'd be appropriate to, to put that in there for her. Um, Bob, you might know that guy. Okay, that's, that's Dr. Tony Songer. Um, and this is how we actually, we built many of our structures was with, we used and measured everything in buckets. Okay, we had buckets coming from the river, we had buckets coming with rock, we had buckets coming with cement. And um, anytime you wanted to change anything in your mix design, you had to talk to the village council to get it actually approved. And we, we were joking, we were like, who's the project engineer on this, this, this site? No, it was the village council and they just said, yeah, the concrete looks a little wet or the concrete looks a little dry, you can add another bucket. Um, so it was, a, it was a much different experience for me personally. I had um, done a lot of service work in the States where things were much more controlled. Um, so we, we built this house. We also built a bridge. You see lots of bucket brigades. That's how we moved everything around in Vietnam is via a bucket. Um, and our students worked together with um, local 
individuals, okay, and we kind of learn from each other. And if you notice in those photos, there are pictures of us with Vietnamese students. And so we work together with them. And that's one of the things that I really like about working with the organization PeaceWork is while we're doing service learning, we have a real collaboration with the community. And we work together with the community. So it's not a hand out, it's a hand up. And that's what we really kind of stress to our students in terms of students that want to come on these trips. We really, you know, if they say, oh, I want to come because I want to help people or I want to change people, you're, you're, you're not going to help change people's minds. You are not going to change the politics of any country. You're going to interact with individuals and you're going to have an impact on those individuals. So um, I, so people say, well, after I went, because we interview our students before we take them on these trips to find out, why do you want to go on spring break to some place that doesn't have electricity, you're going to be sleeping on the ground, and you're going to work your tail off for five days when you could be you know, in the Caribbean sipping a pina colada. Um, so we want to know why students want to go. And I usually question their motives. Um, if they're thinking that they're going to, to save a community or educate people and Really, my favorite one is, I just want to go for the experience. Like, okay, well, yeah, there's, there's a point there for an experience, but you really need to embody the idea that you're working with people. And the, the goal is to create a relationship and hopefully learn something from one another. So we actually did finish the house. Okay, we were uh, unveiling, there's a plaque that dedicated the house. Um, and there's our whole crew at the, the last day. And the idea behind the whole Viet Vietnam trip for me was, I think we can make this work. I think that we can um, work with students of all different majors, because that was one of the big concerns that our program had was, OK, are we just going to have construction students? Because the idea with the School of Construction is to really um, draw in everybody that has an interest in construction. So how are we going to do build things with students from all over, all over campus? Well, as I said, no offense to any religion majors in the audience, but if I can get religion majors to get excited about building, I thought we can, we can do this with any major. So that was one of the big milestones for me personally in terms of how do I get a service learning program off the ground um, that's going to be diverse. Um, and I figured we can do it. The next project, and this is, this is something that I also discovered with the Vietnamese, Vietnam trip that carried over into this Kenya project, is that if you don't have local people on the ground okay, that know the community, that work in the community, and are willing to work with you, it probably isn't going to be as easy to work in the community as you possibly would like to, especially if you're bringing students. Um, in Vietnam, PeaceWork had an excellent network. We worked with the University of Kanta, um, and there was a very strong relationship there. So we had partners on the ground, and you, were, you had a presence in the community. Um, PeaceWork had been working in that community for six years, so there was a relationship. Um, right after I got back from Vietnam, um, the, the director of PeaceWork came to my office at Virginia Tech and said, OK, you know, we heard great things about how you did in Vietnam. We have a, I just met with somebody from Kenya who says that their orphanage is in danger of being closed if they don't get some needed construction repairs. Now, they didn't have a relationship with these individuals, and so they asked, they said, could you find somebody else, you and somebody else, to go down to Kenya and evaluate what this situation is? Um, and so I convinced Dr. Annie Pierce, I don't know if any of you know, know Annie, um, but she had said to me, if I, ever wanted to, if I ever wanted to do a service learning program in Africa, because it was her goal to get to every continent before she turned 40. So she said, she's like, if you have anything in Africa, let me know. So I said, hey, I got something in Africa, let's go. So we had no idea what we were getting into. Um, and this project really cemented in my mind the fact and the, the importance of a relationship with the community. Um, we went to two villages, the Wabuye village, which is where the orphanage was, and then the Nageta village, where we were, be we were helping them dig a well. Um, this was what we walked into. There were these um, two buildings. One was a female uh, dormitory, one was a male dormitory, and then there was another one that was under construction. And uh, we found them in, in great disrepair. We could understand why the government was planning to shut them down. Um, and then they had a contractor come in, or a, or a nonprofit, and we were never able to figure out who it was that came in and actually started to build this facility um, as another potential dormitory with a medical clinic, but it wasn't finished. 
Um, and so our job was to evaluate the capability of the natural material to be used for brick. So, so my geotech didn't go to waste stock. I actually, you know, was evaluating the soil there. Um, and I don't care where, what country you're in, kids love to play on dirt piles. It's great. Um, but we actually f determined okay, while we were there that um, these, these particular facilities had been in disarray for a long time and that the community wasn't incredibly interested in really getting them fixed. Um, so there really wasn't a strong in influx into the community. And it was very hard for us because when you, when you stay in a place for a week and you get to know the children and you see these faces, Okay, and you know that potentially what you're doing um, by saying that, no, we can't fix these, um, and that, that the community is basically not being good stewards with the money that they've been given, um, it was really hard for us to do this. So I, that's when I realized um, on, on this trip is that if we are going to do anything as a, as a school or as a university is that we have to have um, community partners and buy-in from the community and, and really have that relationship. So if you're thinking about any type of international service learning, I'd say that collaboration is the key, um, especially to be within the communities. Um, and so we then moved to the Negeta village, which was much more organized, and they actually had built the well. Um, and they, we sat down with the village council and we discussed all the projects that they had going on, and there was a real buy-in there. And so. Um, one of the local churches in Blacksburg is actually still working with this group, and so we were able to do some analysis and some assessment for them. Um, so that was, you know, the summer of 2007 was just all over the world learning about service learning programs and what they could actually do um, and how we could involve students. And now my, my partner in crime in all this was, was Tony Songer. And we had been trying to determine how we could get funding, because you know, let's face it, in academia, we're always looking for funding to do stuff. It's like, how do we fund this? So we had given a presentation about service learning and about the things that we did in Vietnam and how we had worked with this nonprofit and how we had a community in Belize, um, way down here in the south of Belize, that could actually use our help. And this community was called Bea Vista. And we decided to work with Our Lady of Bea Vista um, Primary School. We uh, gave a presentation about this to our industry board. Okay, now if you notice these dates, the economy hasn't crashed yet. So people are still excited about giving us money and doing things. And we gave a presentation to our industry board. And at the end of the presentation, our industry board chair walked up to the two of us and said, I'll fund it. Just like that, we almost we almost fainted. We were like, "What? You'll you'll fund?" He's like, "I'll fund it. The only criteria I have is that my wife and I can come with you, and you will put us to work." Okay, so here is an owner of a company, you know, and then Ross Myers, who some of you may know, also said, "I want to fund the next project." He said, "But I want it to be in Honduras because I have a lot of Honduran um, workers, and I want people in my company to go with you." Um, at that same meeting, Kiwit came up to us and said, we want to send some of our employees with you. Okay, so all of a sudden now it's like, okay, we really need to get this organized and pulled together. And then, oh, by the way, the Dean of Architecture said, I want to come too. So now we're like, all right, we, we have a service learning program. Um, and we went down to Bea Vista, um, and this is our entire crew. Okay, so that is the Jan Wells. She's the wife of our um, board chair. Where is Bob? There's Bob. He's the chair of our board. There's our dean. Okay, there I am. I, always try to, I never realized how short I am until I'm in a picture like this. Um, and there's um, Tony Songer. Um, and then this is our Kiwit rep. Okay, and we had an amazing experience. I like this is our greatest success story um, with our service learning program. Um, we built a hand washing station. We built, so you can see it actually working. People, and, they, and it is still working. So I travel back every year and take a look at this to make sure things are still working and it's still working. We had two water distribution stations, redistribution stations around the school facility um, that we built. And when we went down to actually talk to these individuals about what they wanted for their school, we were we can bring you water, we can clean this, we can do all these wonderful things. And that's where I learned the next piece that's very, very important for service learning. And that is to listen to, and every, every good contractor knows this, every good construction manager knows this, listen to what your owner wants. We could bring them all sorts of things, but really what they wanted, um, 
yes, we brought water and hand washing stations because right here is the latrines and the students weren't washing their hands, but very simple things. So when we told students what, we were, what, what teams we were going to have and what we were going to be building, um, these pathways, okay, we built these pathways primarily because during the rainy season, the teachers said they couldn't get from building to building because the water builds up so much in this area in short periods of time during the monsoons, it'll drain quickly away, but during the time that the monsoon is actually happening, they can't move around their school facility. So they wanted paths. They were like, we could bring you clean water, but they wanted paths. We also said we were building trash receptacles. The dean, my, this was my absolute favorite. And when I told our, our dean, Jack Davis, I said, okay, Jack, we're, we're gonna be building these trash receptacles. And he said, what? Why can't we just bring in Rubbermaid containers and like, leave? why do we need to do this? And um, the, the key enemy of trash in Belize is dogs. Okay, so what would happen is the students would collect things, they'd put them in trash bins, the dogs would knock them over and spread the trash all around the, the schoolyard and the kids would be back out there the next day picking up the trash. So it was like, oh, okay, we need a secure place. We also located them, the trash, the trash receptacles, we joked about them as being the easiest thing that we could ever build, but they were our greatest challenge. Um, because trash pickup, there's no waste management over there, the mayor of the town comes around in a pickup truck and picks up the trash. So can you imagine your mayor picking up the trash? Um, so most people can't. Um, so we had these trash receptacles that opened out so he could just back up his pickup truck and, and put the trash in there. Um, so while these seem like very simple things, and we were able, the water was the major um, thing that we had to design, we had students, we just told the students what our challenge was, and this was an actual class. So it was a three credit class we met during the spring semester. We gave the students the design criteria, and they worked with the local community via Skype. Okay, and worked with, with the um, teachers and principals at the school to help develop uh, the actual designs of what we were going to do. And then we went down and built them. Now, again, what I was saying about having students, our mission was to have a diversity of students participating in our service learning programs. And so we had 18 students. Okay, we had eight civil engineers, four building construction students. Okay, but we also had an engineering science and mechanics student. Um, a mechanical engineer who after this trip actually finished his mechanical engineering degree and then joined the Peace Corps because he said this trip changed his life. Okay, that's one of those intangibles of something that he realized that he wanted to go do something different. And when he came back, he went to medical school because he realized that you know we have engineering solutions for things, but um, it's really more of a political, geopolitical type of thing. And so he felt he could help more people by becoming a doctor. So again, completely intangible thing that came out of this. Um, we had an interior designer, which she was on the hand washing team, teams group, and one of our um, building construction graduate students was like, you stuck me with the interior designer? What are they gonna do? Well, she actually designed the, the soap dishes and how they were going to attach them to the wall and the actual faucets and fixtures so that people would actually use them. So everybody had something to add to it. And then you know the, our English major was on the paths team. And so she wrote poems every day about the, building the paths that became part of the documentation that we have for this project. So um, we had many different majors, many different ideas about how to build things. Um, and then we also had the dean and our industry board and our, our Kiwit guy, and they just kind of hung back and they let the students direct everything. So it was a really excellent leadership experience for our students. Um, every night we'd meet about, okay, what are we gonna do today? And then the, at the, in the evening it was, so what actually happened? You know, we'd plan and think different things would happen. But um, the graduate students that we took on this trip are responsible for leading all the activities. Okay, and the faculty, we really hung back and let the students work. Um, we only stepped in when, we, when, they, when they needed money for materials, which was amusing because we couldn't go to Home Depot. We had to drive for a very long time to actually get any type of materials, but um, the students were able to, to really engage and, uh, and work in the community, uh, work with the community that was there. And so like I said, with our collaborators, okay, we had, had our industry board folks that funded this, our dean that supported it. Okay, we had Kiwit staff that came along with us to help us out. Um, this is the 
piecework volunteers, the staff that is actually lives in Belize and, uh, and works in Belize full time. So they have a, a, a great relationship. Okay, and there's our, we also had uh, some of the teachers that were working with us gave us the Belizean flag to show us their partnership with us. Um, and now this community, while, while Virginia Tech has not, we've, we've done one other project there. Um, Tony Songer left and went to Boise State. Well, Boise State has adopted this group because they have a group called Water for People, and they're really working on the water issue in this town. Um, and so we, we really learned a lot from that, and I, I'd say that this was our flagship type of program, and it is what we were hoping to continue. Well, now, 2009, 2010, all the people that had said, hey, we want to fund things, were like, okay, we got to hold back here. We can't fund things right now. And so we began to say, all right, we didn't do a program for two years, but the Catholic Church in Blacksburg came to us and said, we have a community in Pinyon, Haiti, and we want to build a school there. We want to design and build a school in this community. Can you help us? And so it was perfect because they wanted it designed and built. And so we worked with the College of Architecture. And again, when it comes to collaborators, and if you're thinking about doing anything like this, you, you do need a partner in crime, without a doubt. Um, my partner in crime had left, and I was like, what am I going to do? Well, I found a new partner in crime in architecture. And um, he and his students designed the facility. And we, we went out to the site and surveyed it. And then we brought a whole group of students down in 2012 to actually begin the process of building it. So the first thing we had to do was dig the foundations. Um, when you're working in Haiti, and I'd been to Vietnam, been to Kenya, been to Belize, and worked in those countries, um, it's completely different. So every single project you do has its own challenges, has its own unique characteristics. Um, but I found in all the countries that I worked in, Haiti was the most challenging. To get absolutely anything accomplished was a minor miracle, it seemed like. Um, but this was our crew in 2011, or yeah, 2011. Um, and we, uh, getting to Pinyon was quite an ordeal. It took us about nine to 10 hours. It should be about a four hour drive um, because we got flat tires. So getting there is pretty much most of the fun. We, uh, you got to get used to pushing vehicles and things. And these are some of those things that you students typically take for granted, that we're going to get in a bus and we're going to go. Well, we got in three. There were 20 people with luggage and tools, and they sent us two vehicles. And they said, well, that should be plenty. Okay, well, not for Americans <laughs> in terms of how close we like our personal space. Um, people will just cram into vehicles and, you know, I'm thinking this isn't safe. I can't have students doing this. And, but, you know, we managed to get there and it was another, students were saying, well, only four people can fit in there. And the Haitians were like, four people? You can fit at least 10. Okay. You're like, 10 with our luggage? But we made it. Um, this was our site. We also, um, one of the things that we discover pretty much everywhere you go, the first day you're there, it's like we're the, entertainment for the village, no matter where we are. Was it Vietnam, Kenya, Belize, um, and Haiti? These were all the school children on their break from the school across the street. Um, we were building a primary school, so we started digging the foundations. Um, as you can see, as we moved, moved along, um, we worked with a Haitian contractor that, and this is something that um, may not be politically correct, but they don't like taking orders from women. Okay? Um, and it was very difficult because I was in charge of this project. And so we had to get, I used to have to funnel information through, through our male students. And it's just part of doing business, okay, in, in different cultures. And our, we'd come back at night and the students would be like, well, doesn't that make you mad? I said, no, it's their culture. I'm not here to change their culture. I'm here to build a, build a school. Um, so our contractor, we were only building a one-story school building, but we dug foundations like for a skyscraper. Okay, so we had six foot deep foundations. Okay, and I kept saying we don't need this because I was thinking material costs for the concrete that we're gonna have to place in there. And we were being, we were stewards for the Catholic Church for their, for their funds because they were paying for the materials. But um, we convinced them that four feet was, was good enough. It took days to do this, to convince them that, you know, 
we could have done a spread footing about a foot deep, it would have been fine. But um, again, you make compromises and you work with, with the individuals. Um, we dug and dug for days, but we planned and then we dig some more. Uh, and again, the whole team, every night we would kind of come back and take a look at what we had done, what we had hoped to do the next day. So this was something that we found very, very helpful to us in all the projects was to actually have the students come together and tell their frustrations of the day, their accomplishments of the day. Um, no matter how tired they are, we, we would make them do this. And every night they'd be like, do we really have to share again? So, yes, that's part of, that's another one of the intangibles because some people would be very upset about something, wouldn't say anything during the day, but everybody was having very, very similar experiences. Some were having very different experiences. Um, so we would share every night, and we'd plan every night, and we would laugh about what was gonna happen when we got out to the site. Um, we never knew what was gonna show up in the morning to take us to the site, so when you talk about logistics, one of the things that I always tell the students to pack is their patience, because we are gonna wait and wait and wait some more and hopefully things will happen. So some days it was um, you know, an SUV that would show up and we'd cram a couple people in the back. Some days it was a pickup truck with our, we could put our tools in um, and they, were, they expected people to ride up at the top but I put the kibosh on that. They, they didn't like a person that was related, that liked construction safety but I was like, you're not riding on the roof. Primarily because I promised their parents that they'd come back alive and that's my boss's son so I was like, you are sitting in the back of the truck. <laughs> bringing you back alive. Um, we had excellent accommodations inside this building, but the students wanted to sleep outside. So we, we, one of the things that no matter how much you plan, people are gonna wanna try something different. We had students set up all over the place. Um, we, we learned from our Belize trip that I, we were taskmasters. We made people work all the time. We only had one day that was built in for fun. And what we realized is that we were, I'm gonna use the word, depriving our students of the opportunity to actually experience more of the community and to be able to play with the children and to get to know the people within the community. So um, I was less of a taskmaster on these projects in Haiti and we had a lot of interaction with the community. Um, kids loved our sunglasses and work gloves. That was something they absolutely loved to play with. So we, we would play with them every day. Um, we taught them how to do the, the VT symbol with your, with your fingers uh, and really enjoyed um, the, the kids that were working with us or around with us. Um, we also learned that comfort is important. So these are my collaborators. So um, Dick was the representative from the Catholic Church. Um, Hans was our architecture professor and then um, myself. So we, we realized that we, did, we would like some, some time to relax. Uh, we also... The Haitians that were working with us challenged us to a soccer game. Um, they demolished us. Uh, we did score one goal, I think, because they just felt sorry for us. Um, but we, so we played the Haitians in soccer, so we built in some time. We also um, were treated to a musical concert because the, the church in Blacksburg actually donated all these musical instruments, so they um, did a concert for us. So we, we, we learned that you have to build in some, some um, time for the students to interact with the community um, to really get that get that across. We also worked with um, another university that was staying um, on at the the same facility we were. Um, so we got to know those students well. So it was a really good bonding experience for our students to work with different individuals. Um, now this is the following year we came back to finish building our school but the government had decided that they were going to put a road right through where we had dug our foundations. There's, there's imminent domain and then there's imminent domain. And um, yeah, so we, when we got down there, there was nowhere for us to build. Uh, and so we had to find another site. And so it was, again, when you think you have everything planned. Um, so what we ended up doing is our team split up um, I took a group of students north to another parish that needed some help, um, and then the architecture students stayed in the village and redesigned a school and began to hunt for another site for our school. Um, so uh, we, we went up north, and we even found in the, high ju in the jungles of Haiti, we found a little kid with a Virginia Tech shirt on, so we, we had to, we said there's Hokies everywhere. 
Um, what we did while we were there, though, is we learned how to make masonry blocks for days on end. Um, and so we all learned that we're very thankful for the local Home Depot, um, but we were taught by one of the master craftsmen in this village of how to mix concrete. And he was completely barefoot the entire time. And my students were like, can we be barefoot and stomp in the concrete? I'm like, no, you can't do that. And they're just like, but his feet don't burn. I said, yes, he's been doing this for years. I can only imagine the third degree cement burns you will have. Um, but some of our students just jumped right in. Um, we had lots of discussions about how to mix and, and use these. We only had one mold. That was the other challenge. So we were tasked with making block every day, but we only had one mold. Um, we weren't very good at it. The blocks kept breaking. It took us about two days to actually get the hang of it. But we made almost 800 block while we were there. So um, when we talk about you know, service learning and you know, we, we made the best of our situation. We got there, we couldn't do what we wanted to do, so we were able to come up with something else. Um, I was a nervous wreck the entire time because I thought, okay, our group split up. I can't, I don't know what's going on down, down south, I'm up north, but it was fine. It, it, logistically, everything, everything worked out, but the key when you're doing any, any, type of this, any type of work like this is to just be flexible. Um, unfortunately, because of some situations within Haiti and the political climate, um, Virginia Tech has said we can't go back um, and so we have moved to another location, um, and this is in Guatemala. And the area that we're in, the group that I'm working with there, so <laughs> our service learning group isn't going to be able to go back to Haiti, so we we're beginning to look for new locations that we could go to. Um, and uh, as Bob said in my, my intro, I'm the co-advisor for, for a student club called Bridges to Prosperity. And they had been building bridges in Haiti too, and so they couldn't go back to Haiti. None of us were going back to Haiti, so we had to find a new location. Um, now, fortunately, because I've been working with PeaceWork for years, they had sites in Belize ready, for, ready to go for me, but we needed funding. We didn't have funding, and so um, I worked with the Bridges to Prosperity group who had raised, raised some funds and we went on a uh, sighting trip, a bridge sighting trip up to Naba in Guatemala and it's up in the Ashil Triangle. Um, and if you're if somewhat familiar with Guatemalan history, that's where a lot of the violence took place um, in the early, like, late, or late 80s, early 90s. Um, and so, but we went up into this area and most of the individuals, I was all excited because I spent a lot of time in Peru so I can, speak enough Spanish to get by, um, but these individuals don't speak Spanish. They speak Mayan. They speak the Ashil dialect, and so, okay, so, so great. Now we're going to go to a place where nobody speaks the language, um, but we, were, we went and we surveyed the site. Now, with Bridges to Prosperity, this group is a complete, no class credit for it. Um, they are completely an extra, extracurricular activity. They raise all the funds to build their bridges um, by themselves. Um, and they usually only send five to six students to actually go and build the bridge because the community works with us. Um, the biggest challenge that we had with this group okay, is that Bridges to Prosperity had never worked in this area. They knew that Virginia Tech had a strong service learning international experience, so they thought we could handle it sort of on our own. Um, again, the importance of having people in the community that you've worked with is critical. Um, when we showed up, the community was supposed to have had the foundations dug and these, um, the actual uh, pylons or the pillars, the abutment area for our bridges, they were supposed to have them done. We showed up and nothing had been done on site. So there's, you see, five, five students, myself and two Bridges to Prosperity volunteers. Um, and we didn't have anybody from the community, we didn't have supplies, and we began to find out that there were rumors about that we were getting paid to build this bridge, so the community didn't want to come out and work with us. Um, so it was, again, an eye-opening experience related to if you don't have a relationship in the community, it could be a little bit difficult. But this particular community, there was a school on one side of the, the river, and when you see this, this, it's really what we would call a stream, um, this span here, the water would come up to about the top of this second tier. Um, and so the 
teachers and students that lived on this side could not get to the school on the other side. So during the rainy season, you may go to school, you may not go to school. If you could get to school, um, your teacher might not be there. Or the school could be underwater. And so the uh, one group built a wall around the school, and another group, our group, came and built this bridge. So guess how long it took us to build this bridge? I'm still absolutely flabbergasted that we managed to pull this off. Ten days. Wow. Ten days. I have never been so impressed with five students in my entire life. Sorry, Sheila. Okay. Um, yeah, ten days. We had... Yes, it's all stone, um, all stone. Um, they had some, some masonry block that we, we actually purchased and had in the community. So one of the biggest challenges, again, with us was the community relationship. It wasn't there, and we had some challenges. Um, we, we had a local individual that we were working with, but they told us things were done, and they weren't done. So what, one of the things that I personally like about working with PeaceWork is that the people that work with PeaceWork live in the country. And they know what's going on, and they're not going to tell us, oh, yes, the foundation's dug. You know, when, when you get off the plane in Guatemala City and you drive seven hours and you get to the site and you're expecting to see a foundation and you see nothing, the students were just like, okay, well, what do we do? And our partners, okay, we had um, we we had the girls team and the boys team up on this on this trip, but um, Neil and Benji Hayek are two volunteers for um, Bridges to Prosperity. They live in um, Michigan, and they volunteer their time to come down and help us. And they said that these two said that they've never seen a community like that before. They kept telling us it's normally not like this. Normally the community is involved. Um, but we've decided not to go back to that community. We did another sighting um, in another community that actually the village individuals within the village came out and surveyed the site with us. So they're really bought into it. And we have a representative that's living in the area. So we think we're going to be OK for, for this, um, this upcoming bridge that we're building. But um, these two individuals volunteer their time um, for not just our chapter, but for all chapters all over the place. And they're currently training. Bridges to Prosperity has a, um, a structure where you have to be a master bridge constructor in order to lead one of these projects. So I'm in the process of being trained as a master br bridge constructor, um, and these two are doing my training for me. But um, I was so proud of these students because they didn't give up. They kept working, and we managed to finish, finish this bridge. Um, so. This is the community. These are the teachers. One afternoon, the teachers came out to help us because they realized that nobody from the village was helping us. Um, these ladies were in high-heeled shoes, schlepping rocks and helping us, you know, um, place concrete and, and build up this abutment. So it was a, it was a really interesting experience for us all. And I like to say it's our Monet Bridge because it was it was just absolutely beautiful that morning you know when it's all over you're like wow that's so pretty forget the fact that we've you know one of our one of our, our um, volunteers got attacked by a dog you know it was you never know what's going to happen and you just have to kind of be almost prepared for anything and not not let it let it throw you so economies pick back up again we have individuals that want to fund us and want to get back involved with our, our service learning group and so we um, we started a project this spring break, um, and it was a senior capstone project. And what we did was a feasibility study, because you don't really have to fund a feasibility study. You don't have to build anything. Um, so now I have funding for, for next year. But we went um, to, everybody says you, you picked a really tough place this time. I've learned my lesson. Um, we are on a small island off the coast of Belize City called Key Cocker, and we are we actually are implementing it. The village council has agreed. We were doing a feasibility study for a recycling program on the island. Um, it's heavy tourism, um, and what we were finding is that they don't recycle at all. Most of it goes into the water. Belize has the second largest reef system in the world. It's the first largest living reef system next to because the, the barrier reef, most of that or parts of that are dying. Um, but the plastics are really threatening the reef, which is threatening their way of life. And it's also the trash and things on the island are really threatening their, their livelihood with tourism. Um, tourists are well trained. They know how to recycle. 
uh, but there's no recycling capabilities on the island. Um, we met with local recyclers in Belize City and in Guatemala, and we found that, yes, there is an actual market for recycled materials. They just can't figure out how to get it. And so what the students did for throughout this semester is um, they went, we went to the island twice, and we surveyed everybody on the island. Now, the island is five miles long, one mile wide. So, yeah, we, people know who we are. Um, and we really tried to raise the issue of recycling and how it could be done within that community. Um, we did resident surveys. We, we pretty much hit every resident on the island. They'd see us coming. And what we, we actually gave them a re, uh, reusable bag, which is what every student's carrying. If they took our survey, we gave them a reusable bag that they could use at the local grocery stores. We had the businesses um, were supporting us. Um, and they'd see us coming and they'd say, can we have another bag? We'll do another survey if we can have another bag. And so um, we really did a thorough survey of the island to determine how, if people would recycle, if the businesses would recycle, how we could collect um, and use the recycling. And then we presented our final solution to the village council. And this is the village council chairman, and he's wearing one of our bags. Um, <laughs> and uh, they've agreed to it. <laughs> they've agreed to implement it. Now, it took us an entire semester to get a lot of this stuff done because Belize is an island. Time is very different on an island. And we didn't hear the, the, we didn't hear the term island time, but it was just the, the constant, it's Belizean time. You know, we'll get there when we get there. And so it really taught our students patience. It really taught our students how to um, be resourceful in finding information. Um, we also worked in one of the local schools um, helping them, one of the local high schools, helping them um, with a third story renovation. So nobody knew how to hang doors. It was amazing. So when our students showed up, they said, we've got, we need somebody to hang doors. So the students were like, really? You, you don't know how to hang doors. They needed somebody to hang the doors. So they were, these three were heroes because they hung these doors. And um, we tried to educate them. But doors should not open into stairs, but they weren't buying it. This is how they wanted it. So. Um, we installed them, and then as there's a large festival on the island every year coming up in June, and we wanted to raise the awareness of recycling. Um, and throughout our project, we'd been working with the high school, and they had said, we have this idea to build this kayak out of plastic bottles. We've seen all these, these videos online, so we want to do that. Well, they collected all the plastic bottles. Whoops. And then they had us, when we got there, we tried to figure out how to build this thing. Um, we, we got about that far because the epoxy hadn't dried, but on our return trip, we were able to kind of finish it. And I didn't, I didn't take any pictures of it, but um, it will be featured during Lobster Fest. And it actually does float. So it's, it's more of an idea of saying, look, you, you, we can recycle, we can reuse, we can do these things. Um, so the island is very happy. Um, I have two students going back in a month to take a look at how the recycling process is going. Um, we have a barge system set up, and, and the community really came together. And again, it was because we had a relationship. Our partner lives on the island. She actually started the high school on the island, so we really had a, had a real in, in for this particular project. But um, we will actually be going back and installing recycling containers, and we've also helped with signage and things like that for the actual route that the trucks will actually follow to collect trucks. Let me back that up. The golf carts, because that's all that's on the island, will go to actually collect this and then bring it to the barge. So the idea was to actually see if we could get it working on the island, and if it worked on the island, okay, we could then export the idea and the, the um, concept to other places in Belize. So we're going to have students continue to do that. Um, over the next couple of years. So whether it is building a house, so there's our, our Vietnamese gentleman that was just very stoic throughout our entire, entire trip. When we handed him the keys, we finally saw a big old smile. So we gave that man a house. Um, in Belize, we, this is one of my favorite volunteers. He still volunteers with Peace Work every year in Belize. And so since 2008, from that trip. He still comes back every year and volunteers. But Cornell is our, our local salsa dancer, so he was teaching, teaching students or um, children how to dance. So whether it's building a house, teaching students how to dance, 
Um, there's Amy Pierce and I were teaching the children in Kenya how to make funny faces and do bunny ears when we take pictures. Um, teaching kids in Haiti how to make the VT sign, ensuring students can get back and forth to their school, okay, or just simply installing a door. Um, I firmly believe that service learning overall, while it's filled with lots of challenges, it can be incredibly frustrating, um, but when it's all over, it's an incredibly rewarding experience for both you, the community, okay, and the, the people that you're working with. So if you're ever thinking about doing any type of service learning okay, with your students or anything like that, I would suggest, and this is a personal plug because I've done trips with, without them, and trust me, working with our local partner of PeaceWork um, is just absolutely fantastic. The experience is much better when you work with a partner that actually is within the community. Uh, and I found that out the hard way in some situations. So thank you for your attention and your time. Um, I hope that you got to see some of the things that we were able to do. And they're very, they're varied. And it all depends upon the funding capabilities that you have and the people that are willing to come with you and work on these projects. So, thank you. Chris, that was really fantastic. Now, we are webcasting this, so uh, anyone has any questions, that's why I have the mic. So I guess, Adam, you, you're picking this up, Bill? Okay. So anyone has any questions um, for, uh, for, for Chris, uh, and as well as any online questions, uh, You'll let, you'll let us know, Jess. Okay, so uh, so I'll open up the floor. Any questions? May I start with one? Sure. Um, is there a way for other schools like maybe Drexel University to collaborate with Virginia Tech in something like this? Especially, uh, the timing has been like spring break. Do you do anything in the summer at all? Yes. Um, we're actually trying to get away from spring break because spring break airfares are expensive. Um, and let's just say that every service group, every church group that wants to do, a, do a, a project usually does it during that time frame. So we are moving our projects now to summer um, or to Christmas is when we found, found that it works better. It actually works better for the communities. We began to ask the communities, they said, Everybody wants to come during that, that month of March is just disastrous for them. So yes, so it can be any time during the year, and we welcome collaborations. I mean, we had an excellent collaboration with Wake Forest, um, and so yes. Yeah, J Jim Safe has had a great idea that perhaps this might be something good for our freshmen. You know, uh, our beyond sophomore, they're always tied up on co-ops, yes. but. You know, we want to start thinking, you know, have them start thinking about uh, civic engagement and giving back, paying forward early. And so J Jim's idea, is th I think, is a great one. And to maybe leverage our, our affinity and, you know, your experience, um, I think would be something that we really should explore. You know, what do the faculty from CM here think about that, you know? Yeah, it's it is. I, I I will admit it is daunting, and it does it does take time. Um, but it, you know, I could say on the other the other side of the trip, when you look back on it, it's it's phenomenal, and it's phenomenal. It, you will be amazed at the things that you can actually get done. I um, mean, just very quickly in Belize, when we showed up, we were half women, half men, and in Belize, it's not customary for women to do construction work. So when we showed up at the school, the principal was like, "What are they going to do in a week?" and we just knock your socks off. And, and again, you will be amazed at what your students can produce. I think phenomenal is the right word, so of your work, great. Um, I wonder if you see a value of having a formalized master schedule, risk management plan, procurement purchasing plan, etc. I'm sure they're embedded in what you did, but to be able to scale it out, those wonder if they could be helpful. Yes, we, we do have, the university has a very strict policy on a risk management plan. Um, we do have a schedule. So again, I'm, you're bringing students and their parents want to know where they are every minute of every day. And so we do have a very detailed schedule. Um, again, we start off with 
with a plan. It changes, but we always have a, a logistics plan, a procurement plan. We usually send a team, a team or one student ahead of time to make sure all of our material, materials are available. Um, but the risk management plan is, is very huge. Um, and I have several examples of them. Um, I, before the university began requiring them formally, I always, I, from my military days, you always had to have a contingency plan and how you were gonna get yourself out of a situation if something went wrong. And so I always had that in my plans, but now the university requires it. So, you know, and, and we have, a, there's an excellent insurance policy that we have that will extract you from wherever you are. Um, and so I, I, again, I always like to think positively, but we've definitely planned for that. We also have, um, you know, satellite phones and international cell phones so that parents can call um, and they can call their parents if they need to. So, and that's become more, I'm gonna say, more of an issue these days of, of students needing to, to speak with their parents on a daily basis. And so we, we have put that into the program. But risk is, is, the, is the biggest thing that we, we encounter. So we, we do have a, have a plan. Uh, Chris, uh, I, I noticed you were in Vietnam and I happened to be there too at one time. Uh, I was there in 1968 and 69. But uh, what's the climate down there? Did you feel comfortable? Were they uh, pro-American? Did they uh, make you feel at home? Definitely. Um, it was very pro-American. The only, uh, I'll be honest with you, the only time I felt uncomfortable is when we went to tour when we were in Ho Chi Minh City. I went to tour some of the, uh, or the, they don't call it the Vietnam War over there, they call it the American War. Um, we went to tour their museums. Um, you know, the way that wars are portrayed is from, you know, the, the way that we portrayed and the way that they portrayed was very different, you know, and um, I can imagine as a vet, if you had seen some of the things that, that we, they were showing us, um, you know, they were taking pride in killing Americans and, and that is, that's what is, is portrayed there. So that was hard for me. Because um, while I was here, I was in Air Force ROTC, and I helped um, the, the veterans group dedicate the Philadelphia Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall, and that was part of our, our detachment's thing. So it was, it was really hard for me. But that, that was probably the hardest part. Otherwise, the, the, the country is just absolutely beautiful. The people were wonderful. Um, it was, one of, I mean, that, that, that trip got me hooked on service learning. That community, the university is actually monitors the, the needs of the community. So the university were the ones that selected the families that would get the homes, and the university was also the one that, the, the entity that selected the community that got the bridge. So the university is very tied into the community, and that was our relationship was with the university. So we had no problems, there was no hostility whatsoever, some of the best food I've ever eaten. <laughs> um, it was a, yeah, the, the atmosphere was fine. Now, that could also be because we were in our little protected bubble and we were only working with people that were friendly, but we didn't, I personally did not feel unsafe at any, any time. Hello. Have you noticed the difference in student participation when it's strictly volunteer versus for credit? Um. Usually when it's for credit, um, you get more serious students that, that want to do it. And you know they've got some skin in the game. Um, and when it's just the volunteers, I, it's, I mean, the difference is slight, but you know that nothing, I'm, I'm holding nothing over them. How's that? That doesn't, that doesn't sound really, really great, but um, the idea is that we always make our students pay for some portion of the trip, whether it's volunteer or not. But when the students are actually doing it for a grade, um, they, they take a greater ownership throughout the entire trip. Um, with the Bridges to Prosperity crew, that was completely extracurricular, but it's something that they, they designed that bridge. Now, there was a different crew that designed it than actually went and built it, which is always fun. <laughs> So we've all experienced that. They were joking about 
why did they design it this way? We could just do this and this and this. I said, well, welcome to construction. You know, <laughs> yeah. The, um, so it, it depends. And I do interview the students and for the, for the trips, but you know, sometimes, this is gonna sound horrible, but you know that there's a student that you probably wouldn't take downtown, um, let alone across the world, but then I'd never wanna be that professor that, that squashes their dream, but I've learned that I should just go with my gut <laughs> sometimes, um, knowing that just you know, how a student acts in the classroom is generally gonna kind of translate to how they act on, on those kind of trips. So, and it, again, it was something that I thought, well, I don't wanna be the person that says, you know, this person's really gung-ho, they want to do this, I'm not gonna be the one to say no. But from now on, I am gonna be the one to say no. Yeah, so no, I, you know, some, I'm, I'm thinking back to like a couple of the different trips where, where we didn't do it as a course. Um, and it was hard to get feedback from them, whereas when it's a course, they're required to keep a journal. You know, we, we work, work with them after the trip. They actually have to produce as builds when they come back because the, the joke was every time we dig in Belize, you'd hit plastic pipe and you never knew what it was. You're like, is it electricity? What, what, what are we hitting here? So I said, again, welcome to construction. Uh, so we always provide as builds. So it's easier to get the as builds from the, from the, the groups that are actually doing it for credit than the volunteer groups. I have two questions, Chris. The, are you, so you tend to lean towards the, the model where it's for credit. Is, is that correct? Sometimes, yeah. 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 But um, in order to actually get a full design, if it's just in, so to, for, the for the execution, I've had groups that have executed other designs. Like students will design something and don't want to go down and do it. Well, your group. So Sheila, part yeah, Sheila participated in one of our, our capstones that we didn't actually go down and build. Um, but we actually did two, yeah, because yeah. we did. Chris was one of my professors at Virginia Tech. She's amazing. And we did one of our senior capstones, which I think we only had like 10 people, mm -hmm. right? And we split up into two groups. One did actually, wasn't it the same school? Mm -hmm. They did like a lunchroom and some classroom yep, designs built it. in Belize. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, but we never went down. But it was still part of our senior capstone. And actually, that was one of my questions for you. I was on the team that stayed in the U.S. We did um, house plans for houses in past Christian, Mississippi, which had been destroyed in Katrina. And it was an area that wasn't New Orleans, you know, so it didn't have as much attention to it, but the community had been completely wiped out. And Andrew McCoy was helping us mm -hmm. with that. And I know, we, I mean, we invested a lot into that. So actually one of my questions is, did you continue with that? And we were working with groups that were actually down there. I think it wasn't Habitat was even working yeah, it in was, Mississippi. It was Building Goodness is the group that building we designed goodness, them yeah. for. And they actually, they use your designs. But I mean, it, it, yeah. even though we never went down and saw them, it, it was, made a huge impact on me. I still remember it, obviously. And it was, it was great. It, I think even though we were getting it for credit, so I did, I did get a grade associated with it, it means so much more than that because you're looking at you know, someone's future, someone's house. You're seeing the devastation of what happened. You know, with the schools, we were seeing those exact pictures that Chris showed. So you really see the impact even though you're not actually taking the trip down there too. So it, it does make a difference. Yeah, and so that's why, you know, if you lean towards the, the tour for the four credit thing, it's you do the designs, you have the design and the construction teams kind of working together and then other people can implement it. And one of the requirements for, for, the, for any design that we do is that it has to all be in pictures because you never know who's gonna implement your design. It could be, you know, somebody that doesn't read English, somebody that doesn't, you know, speak English, somebody that doesn't read at all. Um, or a volunteer, so we, we, the joke was, if IKEA can do it, we can do it. And so <laughs> all of our designs, um, in terms of how they were, were put together in the manuals, were all pictures, um, so that anybody could implement it. <laughs> yeah. um, your presentation focused on um, international service learning, but what would you say if uh, you're not going to school anymore? Is there any way you can do international service like construction or civil engineering? Definitely. So the one group, Bridges to Prosperity, that I've worked with has, um, they have, they actually started um, as 
people um, that have graduated, professionals that wanted to do something other than Engineers Without Borders um, because there's limited funds and resources there. And Bridges to Prosperity started out um, with just companies. So Flatiron's a huge sponsor, Skanska is a huge sponsor. Um, who else? I can't think of other names. Um, but that send their, their employees to do this. Now, the two individuals that worked with us are just two individuals that wanted to build. Um, they were, um, one, one's an engineer and the other is a um, truck driver. You know, drives, transports heavy equipment, that's his job. But has always tinkered and done that. So Bridges to Prosperity, definitely. They just actually started in the last five years allowing university chapters. Um, so there's only a handful of university chapters. Every other um, program is a professional society. PeaceWork takes volunteers all the time. I've actually sur supervised other, University of Arkansas, Duke, and uh, Penn State. I, you, know, I, you know, as a Hokie, I actually supervise those, those teams. So there's lots of opportunities. And then Brid um, Bridges, um, Engineers Without Borders is always looking for people that want to, to help mentor students. So lots of opportunities. And I think most universities are looking for for graduates that would actually help. Yeah, right now, actually Virginia Tech's looking for a Bridges to Prosperity mentor. <laughs> Doesn't have to be an alumni, but but you know, like the, the couple that worked with us, they're from Michigan. They usually work with Marquette. But Marquette wasn't building anything and they had they used their Christmas vacation. They wanted to to go and build stuff. And so Any other questions for Chris at this time? Any? Ms. Cruz, do you see anything on uh, the internet? Okay, great. Uh, okay. Just to point out the further dragon hokey connection, Sheila is uh, a, a hokey working with a pair of dragons over here. Tim Stringfellow, one of our graduates, and Jessica Zamuda, one of our current students, and uh, volunteer, as a matter of fact. She has that. Uh, spirit of giving back already so we're cultivating that and Chris would like to really talk more about potential collaboration between uh, between uh, us here at Drexel and uh, the folks at Tech to see you know what we can do to kind of leverage our uh, you know mutual um, desires and, and and how we can and help our students grow and 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 give back a little bit instill in them that concept of paying forward giving back so, so again, Excellent. Chris, thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Chris, I have I'm going to be giving right now, presenting Chris with a hard hat from the construction management program. The only thing Why, is I left you. it upstairs. <laughs> so here's the hard hat. Oh, Drexel Construction Management. Thank hard you. Hat, which I'll give to her when we go upstairs. But again, thank you so much, Chris. We thank appreciate you. it so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, folks. Guys, thanks also for what